Shalom, shalom, and welcome to the YPS Pirkei Shoshanim Noahide course. My name is Davon Mays. We are dealing with the Messianic prophecies. Um, and today we will be dealing with the third temple. Now, we know this is a hot topic, a um, lot of discussion about end times, um, dealing with the third temple. This will be the culmination of, of prophecy when the third temple is on the ground and Israel is back in the land and all the nations will be gathered together, going to the temple and learning Torah. And this is basically um, messianic all day. So I'm going to share my screen and we can get it going. So messianic prophecies, the third temple. So first of all, we have to deal with the second temple because of Daniel 9. And a lot of Christian theology teaches that the second temple was the last temple. And once it was destroyed, sacrifice ended. Well, there's some things that need to be addressed. A couple of interesting things in Daniel chapter 9 is, for one, the term Messiah. One, one of the things that you would notice when you're dealing with English translations of the Tanakh is, the, translation, the translators play with the Tanakh. What do I mean by this? The word Messiah right here, you won't find that word in no other book in the Tanakh in the, in the, or in the Old Testament in English translations. It's only in Daniel. Everywhere else, you'll only see this word Messiah translated as anointed one or anointed. Only in Daniel is you notice this first is capitalized. There's no capital letters in Hebrew, but you will only find the word Messiah in Daniel because they want Daniel 9 to refer to Jesus, even though the New Testament does not quote Daniel 9 to refer to Jesus, right? So this is what it says. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city of the, and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with the flood until the end of war desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. So, when it says the street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. This is interesting because if this temple is referring to the second temple, then of course it needs to be rebuilt because Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the first one, right? But if this is to referring to the third temple, it clearly says the street shall be built again. Now what, 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 why does it say again? And then it says, even in troublesome times. Well, did this already happen? And who was the Messiah who gave the command to restore and build Jerusalem? The street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublesome times, right? This is what it says in uh, <clears throat> Daniel chapter 9. But Isaiah 44, 26 to 28 tells us, who confirms the word of his servant and perform, performs the, the counsel of his messengers, who says to Jerusalem, you shall be inhabited. To the cities of Judah, you shall be built, and I will raise up her waste places. Who says to the deep, be dry, and I will dry up your rivers. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built and to the temple, your foundation shall be laid. So Jerusalem shall be built and the temple will be built by who? Cyrus, after Daniel comes up out of captivity in Babylon. Now we know Ezra, Nehemiah, and a lot of people come back to help build that second temple. And it clearly says, to the cities of Judah, you shall be built. Saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built. And to the temple, your foundation shall be laid. 
So if you want to spin this for, to, for the spinners out there, if you want to say this is referring to the third temple, it's going to be built. If you want to say this is referring to the second temple, it's going to be built. But if you try to say that there will be no third temple, then we're going to have a problem as I proceed. But I just wanted to show Cyrus is given commission by name who says of Cyrus that he will build, rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. Your foundation shall be laid. Thus said the Lord to his anointed, to his Messiah. See, how I told you, you won't see the word Messiah anywhere except for Daniel, but you do see the word anointed, which is the same word for Messiah. Isaiah 45 and 1, that says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, again, Isaiah 44, call Cyrus by name, Isaiah 45, 1, call Cyrus by name, Cyrus is a Messiah, whose right hand I have held to subdue nations before him and to loose the armor of kings, to open before him the, do the, uh, the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. Isaiah 45, 13, I have raised him up in righteousness and I will direct all his ways he shall build my city and let my exiles go free, not for price nor reward, says the Lord of hosts. So if Cyrus is going to rebuild the city, is this could be what Daniel 9 is talking about? The street shall be built again in the wall. Now, what about even in troublesome times? What is this referring to? Ezra chapter 1, verse 2. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth, the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Now, remember, it says, even in troubled times, let's go back here, even in troublesome times, so the street be built and the wall again. So if we go to Ezra chapter 4, it says, now, when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the descendants of the captivity were building the temple of the Lord God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and the heads of the father's houses and said to them, let us build with you, for we seek your God as you do. And we have sacrificed to him since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here, but Zerubbabel and Yeshua or Jeshua and the rest of the heads of the father's houses of Israel said to them. You may do nothing with us to build a house for our God, but we alone will build the Lord God, will build to the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, Persia has commanded us. Then the people of the land tried to discourage the people of Judah. They troubled them in the building. Your streets shall be built even in troublesome times. We see it clearly in by what a verse not speculation, the people of the land tried to discourage the people of Judah. They troubled them in the building. So this is the fulfillment right there of that prophecy in Daniel chapter 9. Now, the rest of the, Daniel, the, the verses in Daniel, we can discuss, and there's, I have a whole lesson on Daniel chapter 9. I'm sure plenty of rabbis and other teachers have uh, lessons on Daniel 9. I'm not getting into all that right now. I just wanted to show that first part of the prophecy where it says the, the temple and the streets and the cities will be rebuilt. This happened during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. And it clearly says that they were building the temple and the city and they did it in trouble. Sometimes they, the people troubled them in the building. So now let's get to this third temple. Ezekiel 37 and 28, the nations also will know that I, the Lord, sanctify Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. So if we know the second temple was destroyed, Ezekiel's third temple has to be talking about a future situation because the sanctuary is not in the midst forevermore. It didn't stand, the one that Ezra and Nehemiah built. It's not there. Ezekiel 47 and 1. Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple toward the east, for, for the front of the temple faced east. The water was flowing from under the right side of the temple, south of the altar. Why is this important? Ezekiel 47, 12. Along the bank of the river, on this side and that, will grow all kinds of trees used for food. Their leaves will not wither, and their fruit will not fail. They will bear fruit every month because their waters flow from the sanctuary. 
their fruit will be for food and their leaves for medicine. Now, as far as I know, nobody ever recorded fruit that the trees did not the the fruit did not wither it says they will bear fruit every month because their water flows from the temple or the sanctuary so if this is a special fruit that the, it gets watered from the temple i don't think the romans would have been so quick to destroy it if their leaves were used for medicine and these were a warrior like people they would have been using that for their soldiers it says Along the bank of the river on this side and that will grow all kinds of trees used for food. Their leaves will not wither and their fruit will not fail. Why would you destroy such a, a asset? You could have kicked Israel out. You even could have stole all the gold out of the temple. But why destroy it when it has this miraculous thing going on with this river and these trees and this medicine? This clearly did not stand yet. Zechariah 13 and 1. In that day, a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanliness. Now, it can be argued that this fountain is the same one that flows from the temple. Let's say it's not. There's still a fountain for sin and for uncleanliness which would basically render the so-called sacrifice of Jesus useless if if he died for your sin and all these things, why is there a fountain opened for sin and uncleanliness if he died for everybody? Doesn't make any sense, right? Joel 3.18, and it will come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drip with new wine, the hills shall flow with milk, and all the brooks of Judah shall be flooded with water. A fountain shall flow from the house of the Lord and water the valley of Acacias. So there again, we see this fountain coming from the temple. And we see the properties of this fountain or this, this uh, flow of water coming from the temple in Ezekiel 47. This has not stood yet and nobody recorded. Josephus didn't talk about it. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe somebody said something about it and I missed it. I don't know about it. Isaiah 2, 2 and 3. Now, now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. When did all nations flow to Jerusalem? Many people shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways. He shall walk and we shall walk in his paths. for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now there was a time in Solomon's time when it says all the kings of the earth came to hear the, uh, the wisdom of Solomon, Solomon and he was teaching them Torah. But Isaiah lived way after Solomon. So this would not be referring, referring to Solomon's days. And it says it shall come to pass in the latter days. So this is clearly a messianic prophecy. Where all nations will go to Jerusalem, to the house of the Lord. Well, you know, in Christian doctrine, depending on the, the, the denomination, they talk about, you know, the church is the body of Christ and the temple is really the body. That's not what this is talking about. This is clearly talking about something established on the top of the mountains and above the hills and all nations flowing to it. And there's going to be sacrifices and a river flowing through it. And it's, it's a whole it's a whole temple. This is not a, a body. This is not referring to somebody's body or the body of Christ or just a church. It doesn't say anything about that here. Isaiah 66 and 20. Then they shall bring all your brethren for an offering to the Lord out of all nations on horses and in chariots and in litters on mules and on camels to my holy mountain, Jerusalem, says the Lord, as the children of Israel bring an offering in a clean vessel into the house of the Lord. So there's going to be an offering brought into the house of the Lord, which is what? The temple. It doesn't say anything about a church. And they're going to bring an offering. According to the book of Hebrews, Jesus was the last sacrifice, so this wouldn't apply to him. Zechariah 14, 20 through 21. In that day, holiness to the Lord shall be engraved on the bells of the horses. The pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. What goes on an altar? Sacrifices. Yes, every pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holiness to the Lord of hosts. Everyone who sacrifices shall come and take them and cook in them, 
in that day, there should no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. So if there's going to be sacrifices and altars in the house of the Lord, <laughs> and we know Zechariah is an end time prophecy, there's no way to get around the third temple needs to be built. This is not talking about some spiritual body or a church. And even if it was a church, there's going to be sacrifices, which will again take Jesus out of the picture. Zephaniah 3 and 10, from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshipers, the daughter of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. What are they bringing an offering to? That altar in Zechariah 14, the house of the Lord in Isaiah chapter 2, in Isaiah 66, Isaiah 56 and 7. Even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. I mean, there's too many verses to ignore the end times in this third temple. It's just too many, it's too many verses saying the same thing. Different books, Isaiah, Zechariah, Zephaniah, Hosea, Ezekiel, Hosea 3, 4, and 5. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred pillar, without ephod or teraphim. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. So if they're going to bide a long time without a king or a sacrifice or a sacred pillar or an ephod, what are they going to do when they return? They're going to do sacrifices and somebody's going to wear the ephod and there's going to be a king. So this is going to be reversed. Clearly. In the latter days, it clearly says in the latter days. So another aspect of the future is unintentional sins. Some people think, oh, you know, Jesus was the end of sin. He put an end to sin. Mm, that's not what the Torah says. Leviticus 4 and 22, when a ruler has sinned and done something unintentionally against any of the commandments of the Lord his God and anything which should not be done and is guilty, this is basically where I'm going with this. We see a verse in Leviticus talking about a sin done not intentional, not with the evil inclination or the thought in your mind, I'm trying to rebel against God. It's just something that shouldn't have been done. He was not aware of it. You were ignorant. You made a mistake. It was an accident. People make mistakes. Ezekiel 45 and 22. On that day, the prince shall prepare for himself and for all the people of the land a bull for a sin offering. Hmm. Interesting. Why is there going to be sacrifices in the future? Why is there going to be a prince preparing a sacrifice for himself and the people? And it says for a sin offering. Well, this clearly can't be Jesus, because if he's preparing a sin offering for himself, then all that stuff about him being sinless wouldn't make any sense, right? And why for the people? If Jesus was the last sacrifice, why would the people need a sin sacrifice. Doesn't make any sense. Here's why unintentional sins is important. Unintentional sins. Ezekiel 45 and 20. And so you shall do on the seventh day of the month for everyone who has sinned unintentionally or in ignorance. Thus you shall make atonement for the temple. So we see the connection between Ezekiel 45, 20 through 22 dealing with sins and unintentional sins or sins out of ignorance, sacrifices for the people. And when a ruler has sinned, right? The prince should prepare for himself and for all the people of the land, a bull for a sin offering. Could it be that the Messiah is not a sinless person? Could it be? Because why would he be giving him a sacrifice for himself and the people? And it's in the same area of verses 
talking about everyone who has sinned unintentionally or in ignorance. Thus you shall make atonement for the temple. We see it when a ruler has sinned, he does, he gives a, a sacrifice for something done unintentionally. And we see this ruler in the future giving a sacrifice for himself and for the people in the same area of verses talking about unintentional sins. Interesting. Something to think about. And it says you should make atonement for the temple in the future, right? Leviticus, I'm sorry, Exodus 29 and 36. You shall offer a bull every day as a sin offering for atonement. You shall cleanse the altar when you make atonement for it. And you shall anoint it to sanctify it. So you, we're basically cleansing the altar, right? Ezekiel 43 and 22, on the second day, you shall offer a kid of the ghost without blemish for a sin offering. They shall cleanse the altar as they cleansed it with the bull. So we see the connection. We see a bull for a sin offering cleansing the altar. Exodus. You shall offer a bull every day as a sin offering for atonement. You shall cleanse the altar. So the same thing that was going on in Exodus is going on in Ezekiel in the future. Interesting. He will purify the sons of Levi. Well, first of all, who will purify the sons of Levi? And what do they need to be purified for? What's the, what's the purity about? Malachi 3, 1 through 4. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? Let me make sure nobody's trying to come into the room. I don't see anybody. Let me see something. But, you, but who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant to the Lord as in the days of old, as in the former years. This, the Levites are getting purified so they can offer sacrifices. Well, if there's no third temple, what would this be? What would be the reason for this? doesn't make any sense. The Christian doctrine behind this does not support it. Why would you purify the sons of Levi to offer sacrifices if Jesus was the last sacrifice and there's not going to be a third temple? I'm reading the text. I don't, I don't need to make this up. Hebrews 7 and 12. For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. Now we can see where this doctrine comes from. Whoever wrote Hebrews, some say Paul, some say Timothy, depending on the translation, because they both, excuse me, they, they're different translations. At the end of the, the authorized King James Version, it says Timothy wrote it. Some translations omit that last verse and take Timothy's name out of it. So it depends on the translation. So Deuteronomy 4 and 2 says, you shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. So if we're not to add or take away from the law, excuse me, where did the writer of the Hebrews get the idea that the priesthood would be changed or that there will be a change of the law? Even in the New Testament, it says, do not think I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill it. <clears throat> so the Christians will say, well, Jesus fulfilled all the law, so he don't have to do it anymore. Well, first of all, he can't fulfill all the law because all the law is not for people. I mean, not for one person. If you're not a king, you can't do the things a king does. If you're not a Levite, you can't do the things a Levite does. If you're not a woman, you can't do the things a woman does. <laughs> so the law has categories. You have to fit into a category to fulfill a specific commandment. So out of the 613, 
nobody can do all 613 because they're not for everybody. So that's already a, a problem with that doctrine. Ezekiel 44 and 15, but the priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, who kept charge of my sanctuary when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near to me. They shall come near to me to minister to me, and they shall stand before me to offer me the fat and the blood, says the Lord. So where is the priesthood being changed of necessity? There's also a change of the law coming from, from the writer of Hebrews. Where does he get this idea? If he read Ezekiel 44 and 15, he has to basically ignore that these priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, will be the ones who offer sacrifices, the fat and the what? The blood. Why are they offering sacrifices with fat and blood? Well, Jesus was the last sacrifice and only his blood atones for sin. What is this for? See? Ezekiel 40, 40 through 48 is just ignored. I'm going to say more. Ezekiel 18 is ignored. We, <laughs> Ezekiel, let's just put it like this. Ezekiel is not really quoted in the New Testament. How about that? And we see why. We'll just leave it at that. Ezekiel 48, 9 through 12. The district you shall set apart for the Lord shall be 25,000 cubits in length and 10,000 in width. To these, to the priests, the holy district shall belong on the north, 25,000 cubits in length, on the west, 10,000 in width, on the east, 10,000 in width, and on the south, 25,000 in length. The sanctuary of the Lord shall be in the center. The what? The sanctuary of the Lord shall be in the center. It shall be for the priests of the sons of Sadok, who are sanctified, who have kept my charge, who did not go astray when the children of Israel went astray as the Levites went astray. And this district of land that is set apart shall be to them a thing most holy by the border of the Levites. So where did the book of Hebrews get off saying this, this has to change? Where did he get that from? So if we fast forward after, you know, Ezekiel wrote his prophecies and we go into the New Testament, the temple and sacrifices after Jesus, Acts 21, 21 through 26. But they have been informed about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses and that they ought not to circumcise their children, nor to walk according to the customs, the oral Torah. What then? The assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come. Therefore, do what we tell you. We have four men who have taken a vow. What vow is this? Take them and be purified with them. Now, we know we read this chapter. Paul says that these men are devout Christians and are zealous for the law. So why would they need to be purified if Jesus purified them already? They're already believers in Jesus. Now, it doesn't specifically say that if they're baptized or not, but it says that they're believers and they're zealous for the law. They roll in with Paul. They come in to see James and the elders. They're Christians. So they, why do they need to be taken and purified if they've already been sprinkled by the blood and all the, that stuff, right? Take them and be purified with them. Wait a minute, with them? That means Paul got to go too? Yep, Paul got to go too, which means he ain't purified. <laughs> and pay their expenses. Who are you going to pay their expenses to? Who are you going to give this money to? Could it be the money changers or the tables that Jesus knocked over? Who are, pay their expenses? What's the expense? Oh, they got to buy animals. Where do you get those animals from if you're not walking around with your own animals? Could it be in the temple where Jesus turned over those tables? Just asking a question, you know. Just a question. Pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. Why are they shaving their head? What vow is that? That they all may know that those things which they were informed concerning you are nothing. So everything you've been teaching, Paul, is nothing. So either you wrote your books and people got wind of them, and now we're telling you they're nothing, or you was preaching what you're going to put in those books. People got wind of it, and we're telling you they're nothing, and you wrote those books and put them out anyway. 
after we told you your words is nothing. So either the books existed and your words are nothing, or we told you you was teaching something bogus and you still wouldn't wrote those books. But again, those things that we were informed about you are nothing. This is what James says. But that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. Because doesn't Paul say, I'm not under the law. You're not under the law. You're under grace, right? But it says that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. But concerning the Gentiles who believe, we have written and decided. Now, this is interesting. We have written and decided. This makes it seem like the Gentiles are about to be given laws that they don't have. But we know this is not true. But they know I know this is not true. The seven laws have long been established before Israel even got the Torah on Sinai. So to say, concerning the Gentiles who believe we have written and decided that they should observe no such thing, except that they, they should keep themselves from things offered to idols. We already know Jacob told them, put away your, your gods, put away your idols and clean your clothes. We about to go back to, back, back to Israel. From blood. Genesis chapter 9 tells you don't eat animals and um, make sure there's no blood, right? From things strangled or from sexual immorality, Sodom and Gomorrah. Then Paul, things strangled in the... In the <clears throat> This is animal cruelty. You, you, the, the, there's a way that you kill animals. This is all oral Torah. This is all the B'nai Noach, seven laws of Noah. So for, for them to say, we have written as if these laws are just now getting put on the books is just it's misleading. Then Paul took the man and the next day, having been purified with them, how are they being purified if they're already Christians and believers and been cleansed by the blood and all that stuff, right? Enter the temple to announce the days, to, I'm sorry, to announce the expiration of the days of purification at which time an offering should be made for each of them. Why are they still making sacrifices after Jesus has died when Hebrews chapter 10 tells us Jesus was the last sacrifice? Why? They should have told James, we don't need to do none of this. We've already been sanctified by the blood and the blood and the blood, right? We don't need this. Because they took a vow of a Nazarene. That's why they have to shave their head. And guess what comes with the law of the Nazarene? There's sacrifices. There's even sin sacrifices when you take a law of a Nazarene. Go read Numbers chapter 6. Acts 24, 17 through 18. Now, after many years, I came to bring alms and offerings to my nation, in the midst of which some Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple. So not only did Paul get purified in Acts 21, again, he's purified in the temple neither with the mob nor with the tumult. And it says after many years, so many years later, Paul is still going to the temple, offering sacrifices and being purified. Why would he have to do that? If he's already been purified and sanctified by his Christ. Acts 20 and 79. Now, when much time had been spent and selling was now dangerous because the fast was already over, Paul advised them, what's the fast? Could that be Yom Kippur? Could that, that be the built into the calendar day of atonement that comes upon Israel once a year anyway? There would be no need for anyone to die for your sins, which is not allowed. But if you already have a get out of jail free car built into the law in the calendar, why would you even need such a thing? You just wait for Yom Kippur and all your sins are forgiven. And they will still celebrate it according to Acts 27 and 9 because the temple still stood. What were they doing on the Day of Atonement? Leviticus 23, 26 and 27. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, also the 10th day of the seventh month shall be the Day of Atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. So on Yom Kippur, 
after many years, the fast was still going on, and they had to offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. Why are they still giving sacrifices after Jesus died? Because all this is going to happen again in the third temple, like I just showed you. You see how this whole doctrine falls apart about there's no third temple and the Christ body in the church and is all this is the new temple and all this new doctrine. It doesn't stand up when you study the Tanakh and when you actually read the New Testament. Churches give you doctrine, but they're not quoting verses. They're just telling you stuff. It's pretty sad. Shalom to you, Ross. So, conclusion. There will be a third temple and sacrifices in the future. Ezekiel 37 and 28. The nations will all know. The, the nations also will know that I, the Lord, sanctify Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. This will not be a belief. It will be observed. Why do I say this? Luke 17 and 20 says, now when he asked by the, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered and said to them, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. Well, that's weird because in Matthew 16, 28, he says, assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death until they see the son of man coming in his kingdom. So Luke says the kingdom does not come with observation. Matthew says you will see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So with that being said, there's going to be a third temple, and we see between the Gospels and Hebrews, the New Testament just is it's not the way. <laughs> That's not the way. So with that being said, Yeshiva Perkesho Shanim, we will see you next week with more um, things concerning either Messianic prophecies, B'nai Noach, Seven Laws, some teaching. I'm not sure what I'm going to do next week, but I'll see you guys next week. Shalom. <laughs>